All right, so good morning, everybody. Today's daf is Bem Zayin. We are on Bem Zayin, Amud Aleph, second line. Amar Rabbi Zera, Amar Rabbi Asi, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Amar Rabbi Hanina, Amar Rabbi Rumanus. So we have a lot of rabbis here. So Rabbi Rumanus said, ultimately it's Rabbi Rumanus that said, Li hitzir Rabbi, letartel machta be'efra. That Rabbi allowed me, meaning Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, Rabbi Noah Kadosh, allowed me to carry or to move a shovel with its, with its ashes on Shabbat. What this is talking about is these um, sort of uh, containers that they would have incense with whatever was burning the incense in this kind of a, uh, it looked like a shovel that was covered, that they would move it and it had holes on the top. And so the smell of the incense would come out. Now after the incense is burnt up, what do you have inside? Just ashes. So he said, Rabbi allowed me to move it on Shabbat. And this is reported, Rabbi Zira is reporting it, that Rabbi Asi told him, that Rabbi Yochanan told him, that Rabbi Hanina told him, that Rabbi Ramanu said this. Amar Rabbi Zira, the Rabbi Asi. So Rabbi Zira said to Rabbi Asi, who was the one who told him this, he said, Mi Amar Rabbi Yochanan Haki, did Rabbi Yochanan really report this? Because look at the chain of rabbis, right? So he's asking Rabbi Asi, who heard it from Rabbi Yochanan. He says, hey, did Rabbi Yochanan really say that? How could it be? We learn later in the Masechet, much later, that you can pick up a child who's holding a rock in his hand. And you can pick up a basket if there's a rock inside it. Now what is the point? Just like you can pick up that sort of shovel type implement, and uh, even though it has ashes inside, in other words, how is he interpreting it? Rabbi Zeraz interpreting the chidush here is that really this, this shovel would be fine. There's no problem with it. The problem is it has something muktzeh on it. What does it have muktzeh that's on it? The ashes. Okay? So he says, but we learned in the Mishnah that you can pick up a child even though he's holding a rock. You can pick up a basket even though it has a rock inside. Oh. Right. So, but, but Rabbi Yochanan said that Rabbi Yochanan said... So what's the idea? That what did Rabbi Yochanan say? When can you pick up a basket that has a rock inside? Only if it has fruit inside. And there happens to also be a rock. So there you're allowed to pick up the basket because it's what we call a basis. How can a shovel be, okay. be, be not moxedo? Because normally what they would put in the shovel would be the incense that you could smell. So, then it's okay. so it would be okay. Oh, because it was used for... Uh, I, I but here it's just full of ashes. That's all that's in there. So, so, the, so just like a basket that only has a rock in it, Rabbi Yochanan said, you can't move that. You can only use a, a basket that has <clears throat> fruit and a rock. Since it has a fruit in there, it has fruit in there, so the fruit is the main thing. So the rock doesn't make it mukte. But if it only had a rock, it's only rock. What? All those... Right, they're bringing. They're trying to make an analogy here. Yeah. Right, they're learning from one to the other. So, so how could it be that Rabbi Yochanan said that you could pick up the shovel that only has ashes in it? There's nothing non muktzeh in that in that shovel or in that container. So he answers ishtomam. So first it says ishtomam kishachada. That's a pasuk from Daniel, which means he was taken aback for a minute. He didn't know what to say. He didn't know what to say. But then he realized va'amar and he answered. We should conclude that here too, the shovel doesn't only have ashes in it, it has incense in it too. Now obviously the flame is not still burning and then you wouldn't be able to move it. But it has ashes, unburned unburned incense that was left behind, exactly. So since it still has unburned incense that was left behind and there's nothing wrong with smelling that, so what the chidush was, that even though it also has ashes, that's not a problem. Okay, as long as there's something not muktzeh in there. So now the Gemara says, Amar Abay Abay says, Karatin be Rabbi, mi chashivei. Really? You're telling me that a few kernels of incense that are left over inside the shovel is considered significant? In other words, when we look at the shovel and we ask you, what are you moving? A few kernels of incense in the house of Rabbi, one of the richest men alive at that time. You're telling me he cares about the... What he sees is a pile of ashes. He doesn't care about a few kernels of incense. 
Didn't we learn? And maybe you'll say that a few kernels of incense would be valuable to a poor person. But we learned in a brighter. Big day aniim la aniim. Big day ashirim la ashirim. Aval da aniim la ashirim. Lo. We learned with regard to purity and impurity that a small garment that's valuable to a poor person is considered significant for a poor person. For a rich person, it wouldn't be significant. It's not large enough. For, to, for, to a rich person, you would throw it in the trash, a little piece. It's like today, we, we're very cavalier with what we throw in the garbage. In the days when people were, were scrounging for a penny, or in places where people are saving every penny, they wouldn't throw out half of uh, you know, leftovers or whatever we throw out in the trash. Or uh, even a napkin, or the way that we take a lot of napkins and we throw half of them in the trash, you know, things like that. Or lots of plastic utensils thrown in the trash. They, they, they wouldn't do that. It's a very so, store point right. in my house. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue. So we are very, we, don't, we, we have a lot, so we don't think about it. If, you, if we were living uh, in a more austere circumstance, we would, have to, we would have to penny pinch a little bit more. So what is the point here? To a poor person, that little bit of incense, hey, where are you throwing that? I want to keep it. To Rabbi, he sees it, he says, it's just ashes, just throw it in the trash. Ah, there's a few kernels in there, uh, it's not important. So how could you say that the few bits of unburnt incense save the entire shovel and make it not muktzeh? How could it be? So, Ela Amar Abaye, Midi Dahava Agraf Shal Re'i. It's just like a container of excrement. In other words, they used to have chamber pots. You could take the chamber pot outside on Shabbat. So you could move it. Because even though really excrement is muktzeh, it's not a kli, it's not a vessel, it's not functional. But since, it makes, since it's something distasteful, you don't want it around, it's going to ruin your day if you have the uh, chamber pot in the room. You're allowed to move it out of the room. So he says, so too. He doesn't want this thing of ashes sitting in his living room. He wants it out. <clears throat> ruin your Shabbat. So, so too. He doesn't want to have the, in, the ashes in the room. That's the reason why you're allowed to move it. Not because there's something in the shovel that's not muktzeh, but because... Yeah, that's why you can take garbage out. You're allowed to, otherwise, the garbage would be muktzeh. Can you pick up the garbage bag and move it to another place or put it out or whatever? Yeah, because, I mean, if, if you have an Eruv, I mean, that, that's another issue of carrying outside. But even if you moved it, let's say you had... Let's say, yeah, it's actually muktzeh garbage. Yeah, but the, but the only thing is, you don't need to have smelly garbage in your other. Right. So if you need to move it down to the garage, or you need to move it wherever, depending so on where you live, or if you have a fence and therefore you don't have to worry about about carrying outside, you could carry it outside because you don't want a stinky garbage. It would be melachah natsuricha or melachah or. If you carried it outside and it was a melachah, it would be. If, if, if you carried it outside, you're not allowed to carry it if there's outside. no... If, in a Rishut Rabbi. But if you move it inside the house, that's Malachah. It's, just, it's not a Malachah at all. It's just moving it's Muktzeh. Muktzeh. It's moving Muktzeh, Muktzeh and you have a permission to do it because you don't want it to smell up your kitchen. Now, Amar Rava Rava says, There are two reasons I don't like your, your answer, Rabbi. He says, first of all, Because a chamber pot is disgusting. Ashes are not disgusting. They might not be the nicest thing to have around, but they're not disgusting. It's not like having stinky garbage. The old graf shel re'i migle v'ay And also, the chamber pot is open. But this, this shovel type of incense container is closed. You don't have to look at the ashes. You don't have to see them. No problem. So how could you compare the two? Ela amar rava, rather rava says, ki havenan be rav nachman hava mitaltelinan kanuna agav kitma. In that, when we were in the house of Rav Nachman, we would move kanuna. We would move this kind of a container that had uh, ashes in it, even though it had inside shivre etzim, even though it had broken pieces of uh, of wood inside. Now, what is this talking about? What he said is, we've been trying to say the whole time that you're allowed to move the, the shovel, even though it has ashes inside. That's not the point. They wanted to move the ashes to use the ashes for something. What did they want to use the ashes for? They used to cover messes with ashes. <coughs> cover. So the point is they would use it to cover stuff. So they wanted to use these ashes. These ashes are not muktzeh. Yeah. These ashes are not muktzeh. These ashes were set aside from before Shabbat to be used as covering if there's a mess. If there's a spill, whatever. They would cover it. 
So they wanted to move the ashes. What was the chidush? That they could move the ashes even though there were still little pieces of wood inside that weren't burnt. In other words, they burnt wood on purpose to create ashes. Because they wanted to use the ashes to cover stuff. But inside the ashes were mixed little pieces of wood that weren't burnt. Those were the muktzeh. The main thing was the ashes though. That's why you were allowed to move it even though it had pieces of wood inside. Yeah. Is, so we're talking about ashes of incense. That he never said that. We were just assuming that. Oh, I thought you said that. Yeah. Before. We were just assuming that. Okay. Right. So now we're saying that it could be that they were from incense originally, but we're we're not saying he just allowed us to move ashes around. He allowed us to move the ashes because they were actually meant to be used. These ashes on Shabbat, but they have in them certain muktze pieces. So those muktzeh pieces don't take away from the fact that the ashes themselves primarily are permitted to be used because they were designated for Shabbat use. They would use ashes to cover stuff. That's why. There is an objection. We learned earlier that even according to one who says that you can move a candle that gets extinguished on Shabbat, if it has pieces of pitilah, if it has pieces of wick inside, you can't move it. Because the pieces of wick are muktzeh on their own. They're not usable. So why would it be... So even if you have little pieces of wood inside the ashes, even though you designated the ashes for Shabbat use, it shouldn't be able to be moved because they have those little pieces of wood. Because you see that little pieces of, of wick make the oil muktzeh. Even though the oil would normally be allowed to be used according to some. Amar Abayi said, Beglilashanu. That was in the Galil. In the Galil, according to Rashi, pitilot were very hard to come by. They didn't have a lot of flax. So therefore, the pitilot were made of flax usually. So they didn't have a lot. So that was very valuable. It was very significant. So if you had a bowl of oil that extinguished and it had, it had some wicks inside, you would say, ooh, I want to save those wicks. You didn't care about the oil. Apparently the oil was abundant, but the wicks were not. That's the way that Rashi interprets it. Tosafot says the opposite. He says, actually, wicks were easy to come by. It was that oil was so cheap that actually the little pieces of wick were more valuable than the oil. But either way, that in that situation, the primary item, the most significant item, was the pieces of wick. So that was the defining item. That's why you couldn't move that oil. <clears throat> but over oil, here, oil was so expensive. But <coughs> one way or another, it was most significant. Right. Yeah. So, but over here, if you have a thing of ashes and it's got a few pieces of wood inside, we don't say that that takes away from the fact that it's primarily ashes, and these ashes were designated for Shabbat use, so they're okay to be moved. And we don't have to invoke any of the other creative explanations, like right. that you were using that it was like a gar- smelly garbage, right. or that you know any other reason. Or that there was some incense in there. We don't have to make any other... We don't have to posit anything else. Levi bar Shmuel ashkechinu l'Rebi Abba l'Rav Huna bar Chia. Tavu kaimei apetcha d'vei Rav Huna. Levi bar Shmuel found Rebi Abba and Rav Huna bar Chia who were standing at the door of the yeshiva of Rav Huna. Amar Lohi said to them, Ma'u l'achzir mitah shel tarsi'im b'Shabbat. Can you put together a temporary bed on Shabbat? Now these temporary beds are called... A, uh, a bed of tarsi'im, Rashi says this either means uh, metal workers, people that worked with, uh, with copper, copper smiths, or it means weavers. They would travel around selling their wares and they would have these temporary beds they would bring with them. So can you reassemble a temporary bed on Shabbat? And they said, Amrule Shapir Dame, no problem. Atalakame to Rav Yehuda, he didn't trust them. So he went to Rav Yehuda and asked him, and he said, Amar ha Ravu Shmuel da Amre Tarvayhu ha Machzir mitashal Tarsim b'Shabbat Chayav Chatat. Not only is it not allowed, it's a biblical violation. <coughs> Talk about getting two different answers. Maybe there is an objection. Ha Machzir can can name Menorah b'Shabbat. If somebody puts the uh, a, a Menorah's arm, in other words, a, a branch of the Menorah reattaches it on Shabbat, so then. Chayav Chatat. That is a biblical violation of the Malachav Makebe Patish. The final hammer blow, which means completing something, completing an item. It's not Boneh, Rashi says. It's not building because Boneh doesn't apply to uh, Kelim. 
to vessels. Really? Okay, that's a general principle. There's somewhat of an argument about what the parameters are. So makebe patish applies to, to no, uh, vessels. <coughs> what? Yeah, that's that's no, breaking. That's, that's not that's breaking. Makeba patish doesn't mean hitting with a hammer. It means finishing something finishing off. Something. Right. Finishing something. It's, it's, all, it's often the most like common used. Yeah, it's the, the most commonly used concept. Why yeah, you can't do something. That's true. Yeah. Right. Uh, adin lo yachzir v'machzir patur. They used to have these people who would uh, put limestone. They would put lime on the houses to, as a to seal them. So the water wouldn't get in, and they would have these sort of like you know the um, you know like Swiffers or you know how they have like they extend. You can extend them with an extra piece. It's a, it's a coating on the outside. They would melt it down like rock. They would melt it down. It's like it would be like cement, I guess. They would melt it down and then they would apply it, yeah, to the outside of the house. So they would. Um, yeah, lime limestone, limestone, you know, yeah, limestone. Yeah. yeah. So they would put it on the outside. So they, so they would have this thing. It probably looked like a Swiffer. Soft rock. <coughs> you know the Swiffer that if you want to do the wall, you can put like the extension on it, right? So they would, so if you put an extension, on, they would, they would do that also for painting or whatever, right? So they would have these, but it was only temporary. It wasn't permanent. So you weren't allowed to attach the extension, but if you did. It was only dirabanan. It was only rabbinical because you're going to take it out again. Mm-hmm. It's only temporary. So. It's only temporary. temporary. It's only temporary. Uh, Rebbe Simai Omer. Rebbe Simai says, Keren Agula Chayaf. Keren Pishuta Patur. This was different types of horns that they would blow. Keren, Ag- Keren Agula was a circular one, and apparently it was a much more, it was a finer instrument. Oh, there you got a picture. Yeah. You've heard of so this. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, so they would they would have a um, they would put pieces into it also, and when you would put pieces into the round horn, you would put pieces in, and they would be f- fixed in very tightly, in a permanent way. The karen pishuta, it would be only temp- they would put it in loosely these pieces that they would add, and they would be removed. So that again, it's the same principle. So what happened to temporary dead? <clears throat> what? What happened to temporary dead? Oh, well, that's we're we're coming back to that. Okay. We're coming back to that. So the question is, isn't it clear from here that the temporary bed should be prohibited? Right? How how could there be a machloket? Rabbi, you have a machloket between the first two rabbis and Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan is supported here by this brayta, right? Mm-hmm. But how could these rabbis say it's fine? So, uh, so in huda amur ki haitana, they were saying according to so okay. So the point is that it would be the same. It should be deoraita because when you would make these beds, you would fix it in nicely. Okay. That's a clear sure. right. right? Yeah. yeah. So, 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 so that support that supports Rabbi Yochanan. Right. So the Gemara says, well, in huda amur ki haitana. There's another opinion in the Braita. Detanya milabnotamita ukraotamita. Ulvachim shall sakivas lo yachzir vem hechzir patur aval. We turn to the next page. Aval asur. Now, what this means is, milabnota mita were these. Le- you would put the bed legs into these sort of receptacles on the ground. So you would have these receptacles that would be fixed to the ground, and you would put the leg of the bed into it to hold it. <coughs> okay, karota mita. Are legs of the bed itself attaching the legs of the bed itself when they're detachable? Uh, our mind equivalent is okay. a pop-up bed. Could be, yeah. shall sakivas. There's somewhat of a discussion about what this means. Rashi says it means a bow that for people they had a certain type of bow with bow and arrow that the bow would have a back to it and this back to attach it. This was called levachim, the uh, the board of the sakivas. There's some other interpretations. So too. the point here is that <coughs> we're not putting. Uh, separate pieces together, but that you're attaching a piece. Be, you're attaching pieces you together. Attaching yeah, a piece. okay. yeah. So it says you're not supposed to do it, but if you do it, it's only derabanan. And velo yitka vim taka chayav chatat. If you hammer it in, with, like with pegs. In other words, if you just attach it, you shouldn't do it. But if you hammer it in with pegs, it's no good. Well, why is that any different from it's the, that's the, the right. pieces to a, to a shofar? It, it, would, it wouldn't be. This is just another opinion. Oh, it's just another opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel Omer, Im Hayar Rafui Mutar. 
If it's still loose, not only are you allowed to do it, it's permitted. Uh, because one is permanent, one is not. Like because hammering is, it in... So what, is, what, 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 it's really trying to define how you go from temporary to permanent. Exactly. When is it considered a real permanent change? So the first one is saying, if you fix it in, it's not allowed. But if you hammer it in, if you hammer it in, it's definitely no good. Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel doesn't make clear what he thinks about hammering in, but he says, you know what? As long as it's only loosely attached... It's definitely okay. Right. So, so clearly what the issue <coughs> is whether you're making it permanent, like something that could stay, you know, and, right. uh, you know for, for, for a long time versus a truly permanent bed. How, how fixed the, the improvement is. So he's saying if it's loose, it's okay. And apparently these beds, these temporary beds, were attached loosely. Loosely enough that they wouldn't be, they wouldn't constitute a violation here. So this would have implication on the strollers also. I'm not sure yeah, because they're not taken apart. They're just yeah. unfolding. Well, These one, folding beds actually have one. detachable parts. Uh-huh. I don't think You're folding is different. Yeah. When, you, when you unfold it, you lock it into position. But I'm not sure that would be the same. But you're not putting because you're not together. adding a new piece. You're not adding a new, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm not sure that'd be the same. You just, you just, yeah, because you're, you're not adding. Right. Otherwise, opening and closing a door, you would be able to go right. out and out of your house. Right. Right. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> Don't, don't think of a new chumrah. Uh, you have to stay home. Uh, Be'er Rav Chama... I don't have any kids anymore. Yeah. Be'er Rav Chama hava mita gilal nita. Hava mehadrela biyomatava. In the house of Rav Chama, there was a mita gilal nita, which was one of these temporary beds, and they were putting it back together in Yom Tov. Amar le'a umid rabbanan. One of the rabbis said, Le'rava to Rava. Ma'i da'atech. What is your opinion? Binyan uh, Are you thinking that this is being done in a, not the usual way? In other words, it's with a shinoi. Even though you're putting uh, this bed together in a not normal way. In other words, because you're only putting it together, you're not hammering it in. You're only putting it in makeshift in a makeshift way. Is that what the shinoi? Okay. Means? Yeah. You do shinoi hard. Well, that's the question. That's, that's what he's going to ask him. That's what he's going to ask him. So is that why you're permitting it? But still it should be rabbinically prohibited. If it's only a shinoi, it should still be rabbinically prohibited. Oh. Okay? So therefore he says, Amar le, ana, ke rabban shimon ben gamliel, sivirali da amar imhai rafoi mutar. I hold the most lenient opinion that as long as it's only done loosely, it's not just considered a shinoi and rabbinically prohibited like the, the Tanakh Amah before said. It's actually permitted. It's not considered binyan at all. It's not considered bakeba patish at all because it's clearly not a permanent change. New Mishnah says, You can put a vessel next to your candles, even on Shabbat, to catch the sparks so they don't catch anything on fire. But you shouldn't put water in the vessel because that's extinguishing. Yeah. So now the Gemara says, What about the fact that we learned earlier that you're not supposed to put a vessel in a place that it's going to become unusable? Like you're not supposed to put a plate under the chicken, the chicken lays an egg on the plate, now the plate has lost its use, it's muktzeh. You created muktzeh on Shabbat. Aren't you doing the same? You're going to catch the sparks. Now that plate is going to be muktzeh. You're mivatel kalim hechano. You remove its ability to be used. They said, Amar Ravuna, Bereder Rav Yoshua. Ravuna, the son of Rav Yoshua, says, Nitzotzot en behen bamash. Sparks are nothing. They don't have any substance. You look at the plate, you see sparks? No. They ju- it's just to block the sparks. So the Gemara says, Lemat nan stamat ke this Mishnah seems to support the view of Rabbi Yossi, Damar Gorem la Kibui Asur, who says causing extinguishing is forbidden. Garam Kibui, we're going to learn later in the Masechet, is an issue of let's say there's a fire. You're not allowed to put out the fire directly. But what if you take a jug of water and put it in front of the fire? So when the flame spreads, it breaks the jug, the water spills, and puts out the fire. So the rabbis say you're allowed to do that. Rabbi Yossi says no. So this would seem to be like Rabbi Yossi. You're not allowed to position a vessel to extinguish the sparks. So the Gemara says, "Vitisbira, really? First of all, Rabbi Yossi was only talking about on Shabbat. He didn't talk about Erev Shabbat. And maybe you'll say our Mishnah is also only talking about Shabbat. We said that these pro- the permission to put a vessel 
to catch the sparks. Is a, it's allowed not only if you put it on Friday, but even on Shabbat itself. If you notice that the sparks are flying, you can put the plate. And, that, and when we said that you can't put water in the plate, that wasn't only on Shabbat, even on Erev Shabbat. Now, did Rabbi Yossi say you can't put jugs with water around your house on Erev Shabbat? No. He was only talking about on Shabbat itself. Mm. So this is not Rabbi Yossi. This is problematic according to everybody. Ela amar Ravashi. Ravashi says, Afilu tema Rabbanan. This is something everybody agrees with. Shanei hacha. Mipnei shemikarev et kibuyon. Because you are facilitating and bringing about the extinguishing on Shabbat. In other words, these nitzotzot, these sparks will go out anyway, but you're facilitating the extinguishing. How is this different? It's more direct. Because in the case of jugs, okay, you put a jug in front of the fire, the flame comes, the flame breaks the jug open and the water comes out. Here, the water's open. The, 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 the sparks are going to fall directly onto the water and be extinguished. But what does it make a difference whether it's more direct or less direct? The intention is the same. Right, but you're, the question is how direct is your action effectuating the, the extinguishing? In one case, your action by itself is nothing. The fire actually brings the water because it breaks the jug open and causes the water to spill. You just left the jug there. Here, you actually put the water right there. So what the spark's going in. Like, what does that make a difference? It makes a difference because it's, it's one step less direct. So it's one step more removed. So the point is that even the rabbis could prohibit it. They might be lenient when there's two steps removed, but they might not be lenient when there's one step. Water here, not just an empty plate, right? Right, we're talking only with water. Now, there's still a question of why is it a problem to set something up before Shabbat that's going to happen on Shabbat. Right. <clears throat> right. So, so some say because since you have this set up, you might actually move the plate on Shabbat to try to catch the sparks. And then you're going to be involved in it directly. That's the concern. That's why. The, the Tosafot here mentions that in the Yerushalmi, they actually end up ruling like the Hava Amina here. That it's only Rabbi Yossi that prohibits this. That Rabbi Yossi is the one who prohibits and everybody else would permit this. It's very interesting. But the halakha that's brought in the Shulchan Aruch is that you're not allowed to do it. And ostensibly the reason is because we're concerned that you will do something on Shabbat itself to facilitate the extinguishing. Because setting something up before Shabbat, like you can set up kibui from before Shabbat. It's called putting something to go off on a timer. So you're allowed to. The concern is that on Shabbat itself, you'll get involved, you'll move the plate, and you'll be participating in some extinguishing. Hadran alach kira, hadran alach kira, hadran alach kira. We conclude the third parak of Masechet Shabbat, and we'll continue tomorrow with the new parak Bezrat Hashem.